Time to begin this evening. Take a song book and turn to 116. 116. Mm -hmm. Sure, for the night is coming. Omit the fourth verse. I want to be a worker for the Lord. I want to love and trust His holy word. I want to sing and pray and be busy every day in the kingdom of the Lord. I want to pray. I want to pray. In the finger, in the finger of the heart, I will work, I will pray, I will labor every day in the finger of the Lord. I want to be a worker every day. I want to lead the earth in the way that leads to heaven. Whatever I 
That's the same thing if they, anybody, if, yeah. Yeah, if you, if you need an outline, uh, these are the same ones, but it's been two weeks uh, since uh, and I've, I was assured that some of you had lost them <laughs> over that two week period. We couldn't find them. I didn't know where they were. <clears throat> so I made up some more today. And uh, if you need one, I will see too. I really missed the fifth Wednesday's, Wednesday singings. Uh, this is the fifth Wednesday of June. And uh, was thinking about the singings we used to have, and so I it was kind of a, a different, uh, kind of a breakup uh, from the regular Bible study, and uh, so I kind of missed those. But things are the way they are, and, and uh, we appreciate having any opportunity to study the, the Word of God. So we're glad that you're here, and we're continuing in our chimney corner scripture discussions. If you have the outline, or number nine, which is on page nine, and we. Uh, are looking at the uh, one tonight about uh, almost versus I must. Uh, I want to read the, the article and then come back to that in just a moment. Um, kind of what we were two weeks ago when I used that kind of as an invitation. But I want to uh, look at it from a different perspective. If you look at that picture, uh, you'll see the wolf is right in the middle of it. And uh, that's kind of the theme of this this evening. So, uh, Looking at the article that was in the uh, the outline that you had, welcome to the nice article. Uh, when I was asked by the editor to write a column, I immediately thought of this theme. Uh, there are so many phrases that we all use and have religious connotations and overtones. Sometimes these phrases are scriptural, sometimes they're cited word for word from the Bible, but most often they only have the sound of being from the Bible. Hence, to coin the old phrase, chimney corn scripture. Our thoughts today go to the line, he is a wolf in sheep's clothing. And this is a saying that is attributed to, do, to two uh, derivations. Uh, one, Aesop's usage in his fables about 600 B.C. And the second one, the Bible and Jesus' analogy in Matthew 7.15, Beware of false doc, uh, prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening, uh, ravening wolves. The Apostle Paul coined the expression as well in Acts 20 and verse 29 for the position Luke recorded. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. A wolf in sheep's clothing, clothing has been a common metaphor for any hidden danger. It also symbolizes any enemy putting on a false display of friendship. Two, it is used by people who feel inferior to those with a higher degree of learning. Aesop's fable was told about 700 years before Jesus used the phrase, so people would have been well acquainted with the metaphor and symbolic meaning of it. According to the fable, a hungry wolf came upon a sheep's fleece lying in a field. The wolf realized that if, if it wore the fleece, it would look like a sheep from a distance. 
That, of course, would enable the wolf to sneak up on the flock of sheep and steal a lamb for its supper. It would enable him to do this before the shepherd noticed his presence. The wolf put on the fleece and went off in search of a flock of sheep. It spied some just uh, as the sun was setting. As he was about to pounce on the lamb, a shepherd came by, looking for a sheep to slaughter for supper. Thinking the disguised wolf was a sheep, the shepherd quickly grabbed and killed the wolf. The phrase of wolf in sheep's clothing, whether from Aesop or the Lord, has a lesson. As one person said, frauds and liars are always discovered eventually and, and pay for their actions accordingly. The moral is sometimes also told as the evildoer often comes to harm through his own deceit. That, of course, is his obvious intent of Jesus' statement in Matthew 7 as a part of his Sermon on the Mount, perhaps a lesson we would all do well to listen to. And then I ask you to discuss some scripture and the wolf in sheep's clothing. Uh, just want to make mention of this, that sheep belong to the same family of mammals as goats and antelope and bison and buffalo and cows. Um, the genus uh, Ovis uh, includes at least five species, including the domestic sheep. And some years ago, in the area known now as Iraq, uh, sheep became one of the first animals to be domesticated. Only the dog is known to have been tamed earlier. At first, they were valued for their milk, skin, and meat, mutton, and lamb. Not until about 1500 B.C. did the weaving of wool begin. Today, a billion sheep are being farmed worldwide. The term ovine, which is a noun as well as an adjective, is mostly used in scientific and medical writing. So no wonder both Jesus and the Apostle Paul use familiar animals to illustrate their points. And I made a, a mistake while ago. In fact, I made it and didn't forgot. The almost versus I must was there from two weeks ago for the invitation. And I didn't have a point I wanted to make on it. I just forgot to erase it from up there. Uh, so we'll just disregard that. <coughs> um, we want to uh, say look closely at first glance. Most all sheep or bind look alike. And as I said, this is Matthew 7, 15 and Acts 20 at verse 29. Um, before we get into the discussion of that, uh, let me just kind of open this up for a discussion. Let me give you some ideas that kind of go along with this same theme. In other words, we've already read what the definition is and what the use is of the term and what it usually means with regard to different scenarios and different situations. Uh, for instance, here is a, a statement that perhaps you have heard, a cliche, Oh, what a tangled web we weave when at first we practice to deceive. Does that generate any thoughts for you uh, with regard to the wolf in sheep's clothing? Anybody want to elaborate on that at all? Huh? You don't know. Uh, Andy Griffith comes by for me. <laughs> Remember when he done that? Yeah. <laughs> and he will get himself in a tangled web there. Yeah. Yeah. But the same principle, he was he was neat. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Neil? I've heard it said that if you tell a lie about something, if you deceive somebody, then you usually have to keep telling lies and it gets bigger and, and before long if you don't know what you've lost sight of the truth and right. it just keeps getting you just have to keep telling one lie after another to keep it keeps getting more complicated and complicated. Bob? This reminds me a lot of the, at least the one night in Bible school <laughs> about the deceivers, you know, that, that the deceivers will sneak in. That sometimes it's kind of like this, or they kind of put on the, the garment of the people that they're going to come to visit, come to see, and try to blend in just so that they can snatch a few of them away. Yeah, we. We remember second, third, second, third John and Jude the last three nights of our vacation Bible study, where that's the very thing we talked about. And John's warning and Jude's warning about uh, people deceiving others. Be careful who you invite into your house, as it were. Okay, good thoughts. Anyone else? You're still. You haven't got the, the Matthew. No, no, no. These are just some uh, some things I threw in as extra <laughs> before we get to the actual scriptures. And, uh, just thought I'd, as I say, use the word generate while we go, just to kind of pick your brains for a little bit, see if you had any ideas or if this generated any thoughts. Uh, 
to deception. Uh, here's another one. Um, there it is. Uh, the life of this world is only the enjoyment of deception. Now think about that for just a moment. And you need to know that this came from the Quran, uh, which is the Muslim uh, book. And this is a part of their doctrine. This is what they, they consider as scripture. Uh, you know, that the, the lineage that we understand that the Savior, Jesus Christ, came from is through Jacob. But the Muslims say that the lineage came through Esau. And so there's the beginning of the big difference uh, between Muslims and, well, and, and Christians. Uh, so there are various similarities uh, as far as philosophy is concerned. But they follow a different uh, ancestry, a different chain uh, by going with Esau and his lineage rather than with Jacob. Uh, so, of course, the Bible students know that story, so I don't need to go into all that. But all, all I'm saying is that from the Quran, uh, the life of this world is only the enjoyment of deception. Uh, what What is that really saying? What does that mean to you? Is that kind of confusing? Or is, uh, you say, oh, I understand that. Only way well, it's not like the life and goes is by deception, somebody <laughs> deceiving somebody, yeah. and, and the enjoyment of deception. I think yeah. that's why, I, yeah. And there are people that are like that, they'd rather deceive you and lie to you than they would tell you the truth and be honest about it. That's the only this only enjoyment you got, you're in pretty bad shape, <laughs> yeah. As we all the time say, Paul wrote to in, uh, Romans 15 19, where I think that's right. Words. If in this world only we have hope, we're all men most miserable. Uh, so, yeah, that doesn't give us much hope. I have thought about that. I just, just kind of sprung that one on you. I know uh, maybe you hadn't heard it before, but I thought it was interesting from the Pomeran. Uh, I keep saying Pomeran, that's the caves of Pomeran. <laughs> I'm mispronouncing mis that. It's the Koran. <sighs> Me and my. My brain's not functioning, but uh, the Koran is where this comes from. The Koran is where they found the caves of Koran is where they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. So, I'm sorry, I apologize for that. I had the, the wrong word. I knew that didn't sound right. But this is the Koran from the Muslim religion. Yeah. Well, not knowing the context of that particular verse, yeah, to me it could mean that. Uh, that deception is all this world has to offer, in contrast to truth that we have in heaven. Heaven is all true. Really all the world has to offer is deception. Yes. That's, I think that's exactly right. And, and for what's down below there, lies, trust, money, vanity, power. I mean, if, if you put your trust in those those things, you're, you're being deceived. So that's, you know, I, I can't believe that the Koran would you know, put something Deception is being good. I think it's saying you put your trust in it. You're being deceived. Yeah. Well, and usually with the Quran, uh, it's directed toward those of us who are Christians. Uh, we are the deceivers. We're the bad guys. Uh, we don't follow their their laws or uh, their rules. And so we. This is why sometimes you hear that. Uh, the Muslim religion, you know, they're saying kill Christians. That's they think that that is in line of their duty as their faith to get rid of. Them. <clears throat> so again, back to what we said earlier, I, this just taking it out of context. Again, you know, we have to take this face value, but it may be from the context being some other meaning. But I know that a lot of the words of the Quran uh, are uh, directed toward. Those of us who are Christians. All right here's one more, and then we'll get to the scriptures themselves. Uh, this Aiden Wilson Tozer uh, lived from 1897 to 1963. He's from Pennsylvania. Uh, he became the editor of what was called the Alliance Magazine. Uh, he was a preacher, and uh, uh, I read a little bit of history about him. But that's it's kind of irrelevant. I just wanted to know where it's coming from. He said, of all forms of deception, self-deception is the most deadly. And of all deceived persons, the self-deceived are the least likely to discover the fraud. That's about that. 
You know, because if you believe it yourself, nobody else will talk to you. Yeah. To or out of it. Okay. Is it possible to pull the wool over our own eyes? Especially if you like what your, you know, what your practice is. We don't want to face things, do we? And so we deceive ourselves. Self self deception is most most deadly. So we need to have our eyes open. We need to be aware of what can happen. And you know, this is the teaching of my Paul in First Corinthians chapter ten, where he says, "Take heed how you stand, lest you fall." Well, uh, we need to be careful and not be deceived. We deceive ourselves. To me, that seems like an extension of the one you had at first before. Yeah. What that uh, it, it seems like to say, take it at face value. What it seems like it's saying is that uh, your deception is that you're put that, that the worldly things are more important to you than the kingdom of heaven. Right. It's kind of the bottom line. And so, and what he's saying here, you can use that. You know, when you're deceiving yourself, and that's what you're saying, and that's dangerous. We sometimes find ourselves in situations like that where we deceive ourselves. Don't want to recognize the, the dangers that are there. We close our eyes to situations and say, if I don't get involved, I don't want to have any part of it. Uh, you deceive yourself when you think uh, that you can ignore a situation and it'll go away. <clears throat> Jim? Um, I think that kind of lines up well with the discussion you had two or three weeks ago about interpreting the, the Bible differently, who's right and who's wrong. Uh, but in that same manner, you could deceive yourself into believing what you want to believe to be scriptural. If you're not careful, so to me, anyone would have to be aware of that, that you're not deceiving yourself in your interpretation of the scripture or how someone's interpreting it for you. <clears throat> I, th I think that's an excellent point with regard to 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15 that we always quote about study or give diligence to show yourself approved to God. Emphasize the pronoun yourself, which is what Jeff is saying. Uh, I study myself. You study yourself. In other words, we're talking here about self-deception. Paul is talking about studying the Word of God that you won't be deceived. You have to know, you have to give diligence to determine what is right, and you have to go into it with your eyes full, uh, wide open. And that's, uh, as I said, that when he says, "Well, we can't time study or talk about the word study or give diligence," uh, but as I said, emphasize the pronoun yourself. I'm responsible. I don't take somebody's word for it, even though I may have great trust and, and great faith in what that person is saying or what that person does. But this is why we always invite people to investigate the Bible themselves. Don't take my word for it. Don't take what uh, your preacher says, or uh, as they call them, your pastor or your reverend or whatever name uh, you can attach to, uh, or, or somebody that's a TV evangelist uh, just because they are uh, popular or a celebrity. Uh, always investigate. Uh, somebody once said, nothing that suffers from investigation uh, but error. And so that goes back to the idea of the concept of truth. Uh, truth doesn't suffer from investigation, but error does. So if you find these things to be not so, then we need to be warned and stay away from those. And don't, don't deceive yourself into thinking that uh, I'm just ignore this and it'll go away. Jeff? I was going to say, kind of, unfortunately, I think uh, oftentimes, rather than study, um, people look for whoever's preaching whatever they want to align with. So they look for something that wants, they want to hear or they don't want to be told they're doing something wrong. So they'll find someone that will tell them what, what they want to hear. I think Glenn mentioned this last week about Sunday morning, maybe, or no, you weren't here Sunday morning. Sometime now, he mentioned Second Timothy 4 about uh, having itching ears. <laughs> And one for your friends. I know it was last week in vacation Bible study. Uh, where we talked about that very thing that people like to have their ears scratched. Bob? 
kind of along the same line. I was thinking about somebody that was conceited. You know, that, that they see what they want to see is good, and once they're convinced that they're right, that could be the end of their, their search for anything. You know, that I'm right, you're wrong, and you can't say anything that's going to change my mind. You know, one of the, the first principles of <coughs> Alcoholics Anonymous, or so I've been told this, is the first thing you have to do is what? Realize you have a problem. And that's, that's uh, and, and I've heard the same thing about Gamblers Anonymous. Uh, those are programs that try to help people out of these situations. And in every case, the, the first primary fundamental point is you have to realize, don't deceive yourself, you have to realize you've got a problem. And so that has to come from within. As I was saying, we were looking at on the positive side of all, I go with the example of 2 Timothy 2.15, that yourself, study yourself to show yourself approved before God. And so I have to realize that it's my responsibility. If I have an alcohol problem, um, I have to first understand that I have a problem. Or a gambling problem, I have to. It starts with me, so it deals with, with ourselves. Yeah. Neil? So, <clears throat> talk about study. I think a lot of people don't, either don't know how to study, or, uh, you know, you have to take context, whatever you're studying in context, and, you know, Every every passage that deals with that, or you can come away with a, a you know, perception that's uh, skewed in some way. Right. You can only take one passage that you know. I've got a lot of relatives that are Baptists. And you cannot convince them that baptism is necessary. And so there's certain passages that they just discount, I guess. But, you have to take all the passages to deal with the subject, then you have to take the context and hopefully you can come up with the, the idea of what's being portrayed. Right. It's uh, another, another little story, and as I said, we'll go with the scripture, but uh, because of the funerals in the last uh, week or two, and I've uh, talked with some other preachers, gospel preachers in churches across the country and either by email or by phone or seeing them at the cemetery or the funeral home or whatever. Just had occasion to talk to different ones and seemingly, and this is really shocked me, <clears throat> the reason I, I feel like I keep bringing up gambling and, and alcohol, um, not because I think it's a problem here, but it's becoming a real problem for what these preachers are saying. Uh, is becoming a real problem in so many churches of Christ that is widely being accepted now that social drinking is fine. And they're arguing against that. <clears throat> we used to just, you know, say that, you know, wine is, Paul Solomon said in Proverbs 20, verse 1, that wine is a uh, strong drink, is raging, uh, wine is a mocker, uh, and people, uh, you know, they don't, don't understand that from uh, 1 Timothy 5. Where Paul says, "Take a, tells Timothy, take a little wine for your stomach's sake." So there are medicinal purposes, but when you add the word "social," it's not for any medicinal purpose or to help you physically. It's for the purpose of socializing. And any program, you, about any program you see on television, uh, everybody offers first thing to do is you want a drink. And so we've we've been our minds have been permeated. We've been brainwashed uh, with social drinking as being an acceptable thing. It's not acceptable with God. And the other thing is with gambling, this is some of these preachers are saying, we've got a real problem since they've opened all these casinos, uh, that a lot of members of the church are going to casinos and gambling and thinking nothing about it, that it's a form, they justify it by saying it's a form of entertainment. And so in their minds, they're conscientiously able to do that because to them, as I said, it is uh, a, a form of entertainment. Uh, but you look at it in, in being a good steward from a scriptural standpoint, being a good steward, being a good manager of your money. Um, you know, and the problem is that so many people gamble their money away rather than pay their bills. I mean, this is this is an outcome of that. So my point is, 
as I said, it seemed like over the last several months, I keep using those couple of examples because I'm hearing this from all over the brotherhood. I'm not saying it's everywhere in every congregation, but there's a lot more than there used to be. Uh, and I can go on with other issues that are coming up that we just I just never thought in my lifetime that these would be a problem, uh, but they are becoming a problem. And people deceive themselves. Uh, that's the whole point of this. Uh, if they, especially if they think that they don't have a an alcohol problem or gambling problem, or uh, language is another thing that people. And it's so obvious that I have some friends and acquaintances that when I walk into a room, they quit talking the way they do to everybody else. Uh, not that I'm holier than they are, but they at least some of them anyway have some respect. Some of them don't. They just go right ahead using the Lord's name in vain. And they don't realize they have a problem because when you suggest something to them, say, well, I, I don't think you think about it. That's just the way I talk. Uh, it's, you know, so they don't realize, they deceive themselves into using the Lord's name in vain. And as I said, it would go on with other things. But that's deception. And that's what people uh, deceive themselves to the point that they get to where they don't even realize that this is wrong or could be wrong. So they, they have no doubts about it that it's, they're justified in what to do. And that's another problem we have is justifying our sins. That's always been a problem, whatever the sin is. We tend to justify it, saying, well, this, you know, this happened or that happened, or I'm the victim of this circumstance or whatever it might be. And we look for justification and we look for a place to blame somebody. Nobody wants to accept any responsibility. Politicians are at the top of the list of that. They can't resolve any problems because they spend all their time trying to blame somebody else. And that's just a waste of time and a waste of money. Uh, so we are really being deceived and we deceive ourselves in so many ways. Uh, and this is becoming a, a not just a, a worldwide problem, but especially filtering into the church and affecting a lot of Christians. So uh, anything else will come to... Uh, these passages. We've already mentioned the one, uh, Ivan? Yeah, well, the, what you brought up is uh, 2 Timothy uh, 4.15 about studying to show yourself free. It's 3.15 or 2.15. Uh, 2.15? Yeah, 2 Timothy. Yeah, 2.15. 215 yeah. yeah. Uh, and you said you just, you just talked about the vain profane babbling. I got, got to look at that the end of the first few down there. Talks about that, but no, I'm not totally clear if he's talking about bad language, just bad language, or whether he means uh, bad language and, and that they're, they're uh, put forth the wrong prophecy. Because later on, about a verse down from that, he's talking about that they're, they're saying that the resurrection had only happened, they were there. Right. So, certainly that, that's. So that was really just what they were saying, unclean the scripture, right? Yeah. Okay, that's kind of what I was but saying. The, but the principle would be the same to apply right. any yeah. kind of language, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but you're right. In the context of that, it's talking about false prophets. Anyone else? Well, as I mentioned in the uh, the article that I read, although well, Matthew seven fifteen, uh, let's go back to that first of all. I know I got second Samuel listed up there, but uh, let's let's go back and pick that one. Beware of false prophets, especially since I just mentioned this in Second Timothy two fifteen. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravening wolves. And I read it a while ago. Any comment that you have? These are Jesus' own words in the Sermon on the Mount or the end of the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, serves kind of as a basis for the rest of these. <clears throat> Bob? The ravenous, the ravenous, whatever you want, however you want to say that, what the version you know, that's just not sheep, not somebody that's going to do Deceive you if someone's there to tear you apart. Yes. Yeah. A ravenous animal is one that, that would just rip your shreds if it had a chance. Foaming at the mouth. <laughs> Ready to rip you apart. That's exactly right. <coughs> and again, you know, go on. Here it goes. That's what I was kind of waiting on you to talk about. But all strippers on that. It starts out to kind of parallel. You know the, the deceiver, uh, but but the end of it kind of changes. Uh, that's First uh, John four one. Eleven believe not every spirit, 
the trumpeters where they may have gone because many false prophets are going out into the world. That part would be the same, you know, with the sea. Uh, but in this next verse, it's kind of interesting. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus uh, Christ is in the flesh of God. And then he said, then everyone does not rise that, that, that does not confess. So on that part of it, they're in the open, but they but they're deceivers to begin with. Yeah. That's a little bit different, but it's still, you know, still wouldn't be considered deceiver, I guess. And, and, and again back to the vacation I have to stay with second third John and Ruth uh, Jew. Uh, Ruth, that's good. <laughs> uh, that they have the the deception. So, you know, so, and we talked about this too. Some maybe are sincere that don't have an ulterior motive. But as Bob pointed out, with this ravenous, uh, well, but somebody ready to, they're wanting to reap the part. And less difference than somebody who is sincere and maybe can be taught the truth. And there are certain rules that, that you follow as far as a. Organized Bible study is concerned. Consider who was writing and the date and the, the context of, of why it was being written and all sort of. But there are others who are ravenous and they just they want to tear you apart for your. And that's the way some of these were. That they were the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection, uh, and the Pharisees did, and so there was a big split that. And you put them together in one room called the Sanhedrin Court, and you can imagine what came from that. If they, uh, this was a a big uh, issue between the uh, Sadducees and the Pharisees. And but they're all of the 70 members of court, and here they can't agree on the resurrection. So, you know, that, you're talking about um, two different categories here. When you're talking about the ravenous ones that Jesus talked about, and then we talked about last week those who maybe are sincere and really wanting the truth. So they're, the motivation is different. Jesus is talking about them, this motivation being a terrible rip apart type of thing. You're talking about the resurrection. They're, uh, they're, they're actually on that second Timothy passage, right down at the end of it, he talked about what they were erring in. They were saying that the resurrection had already happened. Mm -hmm. And that kind of reminds me of what the Savior said. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, very much akin to that. I want to say this is Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. He teaches in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 uh, various fundamentals using nature as examples and uh, things that people would understand. And that's why I mentioned uh, several hundred years before Christ was Esau that told uh, basically uh, the same type of story to people. So they would have, when Jesus uses this, they would have well understood what, uh, what he was talking about. Not that Esau originated or anything like that. It's just that he was remembered for uh, telling stories of this. And people sometimes would rather believe Esau than they would uh, Christ. Uh, but anyway, the, the, I'm trying to show you that the Bible is relevant uh, depending on, uh, regardless of the generation, that all of these things fit, especially Jesus' lessons in his sermon on the Mount. Uh, the first one mentioned up there then is 2 Samuel 3, 25. Thou knowest Abner the son of Ner, that he came to deceive thee, and to know thy going out and thy coming in, and to know all that thou doest. And here's a perfect example of what we've just been talking about. Why is he there? To deceive. That's his purpose in coming. Uh, and the whole story there relates to this in 2 Samuel 3. Uh, he came to deceive you. This is what reminds me of Galatians, the second chapter, uh, with uh, Peter and Paul, and Paul chastising Peter for sitting with the uh, Gentiles until the Jews came in, and uh, the deception that went on there. And in that same text, he says, uh, Don't give false brethren uh, so much as an hour. Don't let them get up and speak, uh, because they are false. And just like the attitude here of uh, Abner uh, that comes to deceive. That's why he's there. Any, any thoughts about that? Or maybe you, you know the story could relate the story for us or anything in that second Samuel 325 that we all know. On 2 Chronicles 32.15 
Now therefore let not Hezekiah deceive you, nor persuade you after this manner. Neither believe ye him, for no god of any nation or kingdom was able to deliver his people out of my hand, and out of the hand of my fathers. How much less shall your God deliver you out of my hand? Now this is interesting, because we normally think of Hezekiah as being what? Good king. Was he? he was a good king. By the time we get to the end of Second Chronicles, what's happened? They're saying he was deceived. Okay. So they are saying, they're accusing him of deceiving him. Sometimes you can take a, a good person and there will be false accusations made. Uh, other times, those accusations are true. Hezekiah, for all through this, had been, uh, as I said, the upright king, the good king, as far as the biblical history is concerned. And then by the time we get to this, this end of this second chronicles, that, uh, there's these accusations being made against him. In other words, a person can have a good reputation and it can be ruined by what others say. About and sometimes they're deserving of ruining their own reputation. So we have to be aware again of motives where they're coming from. You think about Hezekiah or the situation here you want to mention. That the using the Second Chronicles thirty two fifteen right uh huh second read in the this guy so the current, uh -huh. yeah. of course and this and this, uh, this one he he was basically trying to trick people right yeah deceit deception right I mean second second yeah. Yeah. yeah trying to give you about that about that being basically with a device that was the result of yeah. it. For what he designed. You know, that's hopefully that you take advantage of this, uh, these passages of scriptures, look up and, and uh, uh, know about the situation, uh, the idea behind behind this. Job thirteen at verse nine: Is it good that he should search you out, or as one deceives a man? Will you deceive him? Right? Somebody deceives you. Does that justify your deceiving him? I may not be everything involved here in the Job passage of Job 13 verse 9, but you see what we're after here with the idea of somebody pulls a trick on you, plays a trick on you, somebody deceives you, and uh, so you can retaliate. Is that right? Eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. That's that's Bible. That's not Jimmy Corner Scripture. Old Testament. What about that? I was, I was not in context here. <laughs> okay. There again, you have to write the divide. You have to know where to look and what you're supposed to be used. If you look in the book of Hebrews, it'll, it'll face that second. Yeah. yeah, Romans 12 talks about this especially. With the idea, of, and, and Jesus teaching also, you have heard, like in Matthew, a good sermon on that. You have heard the day that been said, but I say unto you, you know, there's it was at one time an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, but now we uh, kill them with kindness, so to speak. We we don't retaliate. Uh, Romans twelve talks about uh, vengeance is mine; I will repay, says the Lord. So we don't seek vengeance on someone, even though they played a dirty trick on you, been dishonest in a deal, uh, or have lied about you. You can do everything you can possibly do to, in a, an ethical way, to make the people understand that this guy or this woman was lying. Uh, but you don't have the right as a Christian to get back at that person. So let's get some information here from Job. I mean, you went from, from eye for nine, two for two, to uh, forgiving somebody seven to times seven. Yeah. I mean, it's just that much different than the attitude. And that's what makes Christianity different than the Mosaic law, patriarchal law. 
the Christ ushered in the new love, the new covenant. Proverbs 24, 28. Do not, or excuse me, be not a witness against thy neighbor without cause, and deceive not with thy lips. So is there, what we just said, is there a cause that you could be a witness against your neighbor? Sure there is. I mean, there's, there can well be a cause that, uh, again, if your neighbor's dishonest or deceiving or cheating or whatever, uh, you would have cause, but you need to, Matthew 15, uh, go to him and talk to him about this. Uh, that's concerning your brother in Christ, but again, the idea would apply uh, to all neighbors, so uh, so to speak. Uh, if, there, if the point is you don't, uh, witness against your neighbor without there being a cause. If there is a cause, then you need to go to him and try to resolve it. Uh, because he said otherwise you would deceive with your lips. That's back to the vengeance and retaliation. And that's not right. Uh, but we have to temper that also. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, who are we not to go to court against? Her brother. brother. Right. So we, we don't take brethren to court. We resolve, he said it in one, uh, paraphrase this, isn't there one among you that has enough common sense to resolve this problem? Uh, you don't take a brother to court and let the civil authority decide among you, your brothers and sisters in Christ. So he, he doesn't say that about the, the neighbor. We have neighbors out here who are heathens and pagans. <laughs> and so there's a just cause in trying to protect property, our rights or whatever, uh, and we can do it, in, as I said, a morally ethical way. But if we just go after somebody, our neighbor, so to speak, and uh, say things about them as they will say things <clears throat> about us, uh, then we're deceiving with our lips. Jeremiah 9, 5, And they will deceive everyone his neighbor and will not speak the truth. They have taught their tongue to speak lies. They worry themselves to commit iniquity. This is the people we're talking about a moment ago when we were at the top of class. When we were talking about there are some people that just seemingly would rather lie to you and deceive you than tell you the truth, to be honest. And this is what Jeremiah is saying here in this passage in chapter 9, verse 5. In the same book, Jeremiah 29, and verse 8, For thus says Jehovah of hosts, the God of Israel, let not your prophets that are in the midst of you and your diviners deceive you. Uh, neither hearken ye to your dreams which ye cause to be dreamed. So sometimes uh, we, we have a tendency rather than face reality, we dream uh, through situations or maybe we want our dreams to come true. And he's talking here about uh, diviners. He's talking about uh, the prophets that uh, would be uh, false uh, in the midst of you. They would deceive you. And we've again talked about the false prophets and how that they uh, were running rampant. And uh, 1 John 4, 1, that uh, I would read a while ago about believe not every spirit, uh, see whether they are of God. Uh, and, and again, one other passage in Jeremiah 37, 9, Thus saith Jehovah, Deceive not yourselves, saying the Chaldeans shall surely depart from us, for they shall not depart. And that's what we were talking about earlier also. Just because you want a situation to go away, doesn't mean it's going to go away. So there's sometimes that you're going to have to stand up and take a stand, take, take a stand against your enemy, whatever it might be. Uh, but it can't be for the purpose of retaliation or vengeance. Uh, or, but uh, the idea is that things uh, can be resolved uh, and just putting your head in the sand and saying it's, this will go away, like you say the Chaldeans will go away if we just ignore it. Situations like that. Just ignoring it doesn't mean it's going to go away. <coughs> in the New Testament, then, we only got a couple of minutes left, but in the New Testament, Ephesians 5, 6, let no man deceive you with empty words, for because of these things comes the wrath of God upon us and the disobedience. 1 John 1, 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So here's where we get into the ego uh, problem. Uh, Revelation 20, and verse 3, and cast him into the abyss, and shut it, and seal it over him, that he should deceive the nations no more. Speaking of Satan, 
And then in verse 8 of that same chapter in Revelation, and shall come forth to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, God and Magog, to gather them together to war, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. So uh, a lot of uh, passages being talked about as far as deception is concerned. Uh, just a couple more of these to bring the class to close. Here's one. There is no worse deception but self-deception. You ever do this when you were a kid? Tell somebody something and have your fingers crossed behind your back? What does that mean? Whatever you say, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're deceiving. You're not telling the truth, but if I cross my fingers, that, that makes it all right. Uh, Christians don't do that. Um, this is from uh, uh, Kierkegaard, who lived from 1813 to 1885. He was a Danish philosopher. He was a theologian, a poet, uh, a social critic, a religious author. He said there are two ways to be fooled. One is to believe that what isn't true. The other is to refuse to believe what is true. And so we, we can, as I said, deceive ourselves in that way. And finally, I only want what's best for you. Trust me. You can see the two faces. He takes off his mask. That's the way some people are. Uh, talk about being two-faced. That's the way this guy is. They say one thing, it means something else. They have, as we said all along tonight, an ulterior motive. Thanks for your participation. Uh, next week, we uh, go to Lesson 10. Uh, talking about the uh, the observance of Earth Day. We're going to be talking about the Earth, not just Earth Day, but the Earth and creation and things along those lines. So if you can, the Lord's willing to be with us at that time. We traditionally extend the Lord's invitation at the close of our services. And tonight, we in the auditorium class have been talking about uh, wolves and sheep's clothing. And we talk about how maybe you can identify, you see a flock of sheep and one sticks out as being the wolf. Uh, on the other hand, and we did mention this a little bit, I want to extend the invitation this evening by uh, using this text again while we've examined some uh, Paul's writings and, and, uh, and other statements regarding wolves in sheep's clothing. Uh, let's look at this particular segment with a view of not being able to determine from outward appearance uh, who is deceptive. Uh, and Jesus and John both have this to say. Remember in Matthew 7, beginning at verse 15, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. We mentioned that about three times this evening already. The next verse says, You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then, you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons? and in your name perform many miracles. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So even though we have investigated the concept of Jesus and Paul's words, there's something else we need to be cognizant of. There's a sense in which one can't tell a false teacher just by his physical appearance. And this is why it's imperative that we try the spirits. Again, to 1 John chapter 4, and verse 1 to see where they are from God. And this goes ahead in verse 2 then, uh, that was read earlier in class, by this you know the Spirit of God. 
Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Now here's verse 3. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit, or this is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that it is coming, and now it is already in the world. You are from God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And so this is why in this invitation we want to understand that you can have a power within you that is even stronger than the world. The power of Christ. The power of the gospel can change your life. The world out here may, may look attractive. They may all look the same. Just look like a, a big flock of sheep out here. And you can't tell but by investigation. And yet you have this power within you when you become a Christian to know right from wrong, to be able to discern what is truth, what is error. And he says, you are from God, little children, that is, you Christians. They are from the world. Therefore, they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them. But notice verse 6. We are from God. That is, the children of God, our God is Father in heaven. His Son is Jesus Christ. The power of both the Father and the Son is in the Holy Spirit. And you can have that power, as I said, with the Holy Spirit in you when you are baptized into Christ. He says, God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So as I said, inwardly, Jesus said they are ravening wolves, but you can't tell from the outside. Uh, sometimes you have to investigate and you have to be cautious in diagnosing a situation that you don't come up with the right, uh, that you don't come up with the wrong formula or the wrong treatment for that diagnosis. So we need to be aware uh, of what we can see in the world, stay away from the world by the help of the power of God that is in us when we are his children. We all need a savior. And this is why we sing this particular song in the invitation to see thee. Soul, a savior thou art needing for Romans 3 and verse 23. Will you come as together we stand and sing? So the Savior for me, so the Savior lays for me, in the world of the pleading, in the Oh! 
Fourth of July weekend. Some of you may be out of town. Please be careful if you're traveling the highways. And, uh, hope you can be back with us soon. If you happen to be here Sunday, we're glad to have you and bring friends. We may have visitors from out of town. Uh, who knows on a holiday? Uh, but we're, we're grateful for uh, our family ties together, and uh, I know you you are as well. Uh, are there any sick that we should mention this evening? Uh, anyone has an update? Jim, would you uh, dismiss us in word of prayer, please? Our Father, we will approach your throne of promise. We should thank you for the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us. We thank for the blessing of being able to get together to directly divide your, your services. And the word of thanks from the Bible. We ask that you be with the leaders of this country to return to you. Christ's name.